That answer actually has two parts. Um, the first part was when I got inspired to become an astrophysicist, and that's when I read the book Contact by Carl Sagan, and I decided the universe was a fascinating place and I wanted to know more about it. I think I was rather young at the time, and I didn't really know what I was getting myself into, but after that, all of my family and friends would give me books about astronomy for Christmas and birthdays and things like that. Um, so reading those books, I realized that astronomy was very interesting. Um, but then, I guess a few years later, a teacher actually gave me a book called QED by Richard Feynman, and that was about physics. And when I read that book, I realized that the particle universe was as interesting and bizarre as the cosmological universe, and that's when I decided particle physics was what I wanted to do. None in my immediate family. Actually, my mother was an English teacher, and so I guess the apple fell pretty far from the tree. <laughs> So I did know, probably before I knew what kind of professor I wanted to be, that I wanted to be a professor. Because my mother, as a professor, had time in the summers to spend with me, to go on trips, to travel to conferences. And I thought that life was really glamorous. Let's see. Physics classes are hard. Um, it takes a lot of commitment and dedication and sometimes sacrificing a little bit of your social life in order to study physics as an undergraduate and, and to learn it well. Um, but I think I've been really lucky in that I've had amazing teachers basically all of my life and a really supportive family. Um, so in terms of challenges, it's only as hard as any other career, I'd say. Let's see. Um, I think you can make a scientist. I don't really have that much evidence to support my theory. Um, but I do know, for example, I was born to an English teacher. And for the first half of my life, I was very interested in writing and poetry, things like that. And it wasn't that I was born with some innate sense of the scientific method. I was just really curious. And I think curious people um, can be either born or made. And curiosity is really the only thing you need to really enjoy science. And I'd say among my colleagues, um, I know people with very different childhoods, very different backgrounds, very different sort of personalities when they were young. Um, I work with people who the first thing they did was when they learned to crawl was sort of crawl over to some mechanical equipment and start taking it apart. Um, so they certainly had a very sort of physicist kind of curiosity, but I know others who were more interested in music and art, and it was only when they started to see the structures and the things they were interested in that they wanted to learn more about them. So I think science is something that anyone could really enjoy. I can put it this way. Um, the most sort of compelling things that my science teachers ever said to me were things like, well, scientists don't know the answer to this question, but, and then they'd explain the question. So whenever I heard about things that were still being explored, which were still topics of active research, um, my ears perked up and I took a lot of notes and I sort of fantasized that one day I would be the one to figure out the answer to that kind of question. Um, I think students really enjoy the idea of exploring things in science and certainly they enjoy that more than sort of the traditional science class where you read about an experiment and you hear about how it was first performed and you read about the answer and then you're expected to go and sort of repeat that. Um, when it's set up that way, you're just sort of doing the grunt work, the calibration and the setting up of the equipment. You're not doing the fun, which is the exploration and the discovery. To inspire someone to choose something as a career or to inspire them to just devote a lot of time to it, you have to have a real reward at the end. Yeah. And I think for a lot of us, although we do appreciate the beauty of understanding how to do a calibration or set up an experiment, figuring things out, learning new things, that's, that's what we like to do. If I had to choose as an undergraduate another discipline, I think it would have been linguistics. Um, I was very interested, I've always sort of been interested in studying systems that may be remotely connected to some sort of fundamental truths, but will eventually, if you study them carefully enough, tell you about those fundamental truths. So particle physics is one of those places where you have a big experiment, a big detector. The detector doesn't tell you everything about what's happening, 
um, in a particle collision, it doesn't tell you everything that happens um, when elementary particles interact. But it tells you enough that if you're careful and you're methodical, you can figure out what the rules are that determine how particles interact. Linguistics is the same way. It's a weird way to study the brain, but understanding how people speak and what they can say and what they can't really say grammatically is another way to figure out some of the rules that dictate how the language centers in the brain works. So I think there is a similarity, but that's the other thing I would have done. <laughs> So now I'm working at the ATLAS experiment. ATLAS is one of the two general purpose experiments at the LHC. It's one of the machines that will hopefully answer all sorts of questions that particle physicists have been putting together over the past few decades. And one of these questions is very basic. It's why do matter particles have mass? Um, the ATLAS, the LHC experiments should be able to shed a little bit of light on the question of particle masses. So um, ATLAS is one of the experiments where we'll do that. Well, I'm often asked, especially when I talk to other kinds of scientists, other kinds of physicists, um, what the point is, what the goal of a big, expensive project like the LHC is, which is not going to create anything except for data. It's not going to create anything except for knowledge. Um, and that's often a hard question to answer, especially when you're asked it by, say, an AIDS researcher or somebody who works on engineering projects that are beneficial to humanity. But I think you have to sort of support science from the ground up and the very applied kinds of sciences that are really useful and important and contributing immediately and directly to the economy and to people's well-beings. All of those are supported by a whole bunch of people who are just curious, who just needed things to wonder about. And so I think the kinds of projects I do don't have immediate tangible benefits. I mean, there are things like the World Wide Web, which is a very useful offspring of the CERN research program. Um, but they do support a culture in which people can think for thinking's sake, and people can do scientific kinds of thinking, which are some of the most directly applicable to, to the problems that we face as a society. Unfortunately, I have a lot, and the fact that I have a lot tells you that the theory that we have, the theory that I operate with, um, has a lot of missing pieces. It's a little fragmented. For example, I would love to know, first, what dark matter is, and hopefully that's something that could be answered by the experiment I'm participating in now. Um, but I would also love to know what dark energy is. And so all of these questions sort of have to do with the bigger theory, the global theory, which encompasses a standard model, which I learned as an undergraduate, and which encompasses some cosmology that people learn. Um, these things must interact. These things must talk to each other, because it's, there's one universe, and there's basically just one answer. Um, but figuring out sort of what the contribution of elementary particles really is, particles and fields to the structure of the universe is something that I'd really like to know. Mm -hmm.